Testing one, two, three. Welcome to another Woke Wednesday. This podcast was created to shed light on different societal issues which have been at the forefront of public discourse through one of the most divisive times in American history. More so, it was created with the intent of allowing those that have often been neglected, shunned, or misunderstood to have the chance to share their experiences and thoughts. I hope this dialogue encourages critical conversation and activism amongst all listeners. And I hope you'll tell all your friends about it and share it on your social platforms. Y'all, sometimes when I'm recording these, I really feel like I sound crazy. Like, I don't like the way my voice sounds in my microphone or really in general. So I feel like I sound crazy. And when I am speaking, to me, I just sound like I'm two years old. I mean, I know I'm not, obviously, but I just feel like I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Even though I know I know what I'm talking about and y'all know I know what I'm talking about, I feel like I sound like I don't. And the other day, someone tried to break into my house, so I have been, like, on alert because I was scared. It was at 1 in the morning and someone tried to get into our house and then the Houston Police PD didn't show up for, like, 30 minutes. And they were like, oh, it was probably someone drunk trying to get, Uh uh-uh. First of all, y'all 30 minutes late. What if I was dead by then? Second of all, how do you know if it was somebody drunk? Like, what if they were really trying to get in? I have nice things that I'm sure people want. Are you, I thought, then one of my friends who's a police officer, he was like, you had to make it sound urgent. And I was like, I thought all of our calls to y'all were urgent. And I really wanted to say this is why I don't like y'all right now because y'all just be doing the most. And then you would have take 30 minutes to show up. What kind of mess is that? I guess next time I just need to get my taser so I can buzz buzz whoever tries to come get me because I'm not with it. Y'all already know I'm crazy. Uh uh-uh. They have met the right one if they want to try to come and get me. Anyways... Let me talk to y'all about these current events. For five straight weeks, protesters have been returning to the streets of Paris. The movement started in opposition to a fuel tax increase and grew into a broader rebellion against President Emmanuel Macron. Last week, Macron bowed to the Yellow Vest principal demands. He halted the fuel tax and increased the minimum wage. Il a pu m'arriver de vous donner le sentiment que ce n'était pas mon souci. After that, the demonstrations diminished, but they haven't stopped. So we came here to ask, what are their outstanding demands? And can this leaderless grassroots movement deliver them? France, which by the way, if you don't know, my mama was born in France. No, she can't speak French, but she was born there, and I think that's so cool, and I love telling people that. Anyways, um, France has encountered multiple protests over the past few weeks by the group called the Yellow Vest. The movement started in November of this year, and their name comes from the fact that French motorists and drivers have to have yellow vests in their cars while driving. A national tax on diesel fueled the protests, specifically in rural and less well-off regions of France, where driving is a huge necessity. Those protesting make up those of the less well-off economically. However, the movement has gained support from a wide array of French citizens. While diesel prices might have been the catalyst for the movement, the Vests are also looking at the government policies that began in the beginning of 2018 when the French government imposed an extra 7.6 cents for each liter of fuel bought. 
France's tax on fuel is estimated to be one of the biggest ones out of the entire European Union. Another point of frustration from the French protesters is that the government also cut down on speed limits on their secondary road networks, which was enforced to reduce the number of road deaths. The French responded with saying that this implementation would not show a significant decrease in the number of deaths and was only done to, quote, fill the pockets of the government. The French president responded to the protest saying that the tax on fuels are needed in order to eventually rid the republic using environmental polluting fossil fuels. Yes, trying to stop climate change, which I told y'all is real because it is. In his response that those complaining about the increase in gas prices are the same ones complaining of their children suffering from the pollution from these gases is honestly an interesting take because the environmental cost of climate change does typically tend to hurt lower income areas more so than the rest. So there's actually validity in both sides of the argument if you really look at it. He also responded with a recent financial proposal that he hopes would calm the protesters. However, many of them are super disappointed in this new financial plan that he claims will be put in place within the next month. The plan consists of an increase on the amount minimum wage workers would see on their checks, exemption from taxes on overtime, and social security taxes for those that are retired. Now, is this actually going to be enforced? Only time will tell. But one thing that is for certain, in all corners of the world, we're seeing a wave of change happening because people are not sitting by idle and letting systemic oppression continue. Despite the chaos and confusion in our world, I see winds of hope blowing around the globe. It is a historic meeting. Kim Jong-un has become the first North Korean leader to visit the South since the Korean War. Families split either side of the Ethiopian Eritrean border, finally able to speak to each other for the first time in decades. Far-right candidate Zaire Bolsonaro has won Brazil's presidential race. Jacob Zuma will step down as South Africa's president. Does this house want to deliver Brexit? The Irish people have voted in favor of scrapping a constitutional ban on abortion. This is about women taking their rightful place in Irish society, finally. A Chinese researcher claims to have helped make the world's first births of genetically altered humans. It's very disturbing. It's inappropriate. A data analysis firm linked to the Trump campaign retained the personal information of more than 50 million users. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. Seventeen people killed in connection with a mass shooting at a forest the synagogue in Pittsburgh. The gunman opened, gunman opened fire, fire during morning. And I don't want prayers. I don't want thoughts. I want gun control, and I hope to God nobody else sends me any more prayers. Thousands of students are expected to walk out of their schools. A mass protest across the nation against gun violence. A new report by the U.N. carries a stark warning. Millions more people will die from extreme heat by the year 2040. India's Kerala state was hit by the worst flooding it's seen in a century. A powerful 7.5 magnitude earthquake struck the island of Sulawesi Friday. Several separate enormous wildfires are taking a terrible toll. The stuff that we lost isn't as important as the fact that our families all torn apart. Yemen's humanitarian crisis is escalating to devastating levels. The United Nations warns up to 13 million civilians are at risk of starvation. The administration's new crackdown on illegal immigration at the border. Over a six-week period, nearly 2,000 kids were separated from nearly as many adults. You know, they have a word. It sort of became old-fashioned. It's called a nationalist. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? In Paris, violent clashes erupted between police and protesters for the third straight weekend. We pay so many taxes. It's impossible now to have a, a good life for us. This is Jamal Khashoggi captured on closed circuit cameras, stepping into what Turkish authorities believe was a death trap. I am here today not because I want to be, 
I am terrified. Look at me when I'm talking to you. You're telling me that my assault doesn't matter. That what happened to me doesn't matter. That Bill Cosby becomes the, the first celebrity to be convicted in the Me Too era. I've dreamt of this day for 32 years. Abusers, your time is up. The survivors are here, standing tall, and we are not going anywhere. Falling on your knees. What I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. So I want all the girls watching here now to know that a new day is on the horizon. The midterm elections were full of historic firsts. First Muslim women. First Native American women. First openly gay man elected governor. It means something to kids and people to see images that reflect themselves. It's historical. It moves me, like it moves me to tears. That is going to have an impact, because imagery does, you know, representation does. Fronts are the champions of the world. All 12 boys and their soccer coach have now been rescued from that flooded cave in Thailand. An immigrant from Mali is being called a real life Spider-Man after he rescued a child dangling from a balcony. Look at this. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. There are no limits to the human spirit. Touchdown confirmed. I believe what makes us unique is transcending our limits. I would much rather fail gloriously than not venture, not try. In the midst of all the protesting, fighting, and divisiveness across our global community, with the new year coming around, hopefully that means there's renewed hope, passion, and commitment of each of us to continuously pursue justice where it's needed and not settling for anything less than equity for all. And with that, this episode is going to focus on the concept of change and the idea that as the new year is literally changing, we can expect not only changes from ourselves, but those around us, and those place to govern us as well. I love New Year's, you all, because it's a chance to see something new and fresh appear not only around um, our global community, but within ourselves. I think New Year's are always super exciting. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be continuously working on yourself at all times. Anyways. When the idea of Woke Wednesday came about, I really didn't think it would grow into what it's become today. I would start posting simple Facebook statuses like Black Lives Matter or Not All Muslims Are Terrorists. I say that these are simple only because I really thought that these were things that most people around me knew and understood, but I was painfully mistaken. Although my statuses would get about a hundred plus likes or comments, it was even more interesting for me to get messages from all types of people thanking me for speaking truth and asking for more and more. So I decided to do more. But doing more didn't just mean posting and sharing different social justice movements happening through our culture. It meant changing and looking within myself to discover what about me had become accustomed to accepting what happened to people who look like me and identify as I do. It also meant changing the way I think in terms of looking at factual evidence and actual experiences instead of making assumptions based on stereotypes or preconceived notions. Now change, that's not something I've always liked or even wanted for the most part. Change means being uncomfortable. And one thing I've never enjoyed is being uncomfortable. But if change has taught me one thing, it's this. The best will always come if you just open yourself up to something different. That's what I did when I allowed Woke Wednesday to become bigger and bigger and accepted the fact that I was not going to be someone that sat idle in the midst of what happened to me in an alienating and humiliating time period, which was the 2016 presidential campaign season. While I still hold to this day some of that bitter and disheartening feeling, and by bitter, I mean bitter 
feeling I had when Donald Trump was announced the president of our country. I have also grown more aware of what's truly going on in our world, and I truly believe that my generation, as well as this upcoming one, has the capability and the power to bring about concrete change. Since the time that I came out here, it has been six minutes and 20 seconds. The shooter has ceased shooting and will soon abandon his rifle, blend in with the students as they escape and walk free for an hour before arrest. Fight for your lives before it's someone else's job. Over the past few years, I have personally seen a shift in the attention to our political and social climate by those a part of the younger generation. Maybe it's because we're legally allowed to vote now, or maybe it's from genuine interest. But whatever the case, I'm in awe of how those my age and those younger than me are seeking the much needed change in our country for those that are least powerful in our nation. After the tragedy that was the Parkland shooting in Florida, we saw a wave of activism and awareness on the ra rapid gun violence occurring in our country. Activism that was propelled by the actual victims and kids that experienced this tragedy that transcended into the movement of March for Our Lives. These kids have taken this country by storm and are consistently making moves for stricter gun laws and for the gun laws we already have in place to be enforced. Not to mention this movement, which is mostly made of middle to upper class white kids have also been very, very good about acknowledging the fact that gun violence has been a huge epidemic in communities of color. I think that's incredibly influential and powerful that these, a majority of these white kids are not only acknowledging the fact that yes, systemic gun violence is occurring, but we don't need to be paying attention to this fact now just because we as white kids are calling attention to it. No, this has been something that has constantly happened in marginalized communities and there are people in marginalized communities that have been advocating for these things, but they just haven't been given the t attention that they need. But these kids are saying, no, we're not doing that. Using our voice in order to ask for change when that desire for change comes from tragedy, to me, is often the most authentic and powerful things to do because for that specific person, the change is not only personal, but it comes from a want to want better for those that are around them. Change is possible, it's probable, and it's coming whether those around us want it or not. But let's not assume that the need for change was motivated by these, that's been motivated by these young people is just a recent phenomenon. There's little Miss Flint, the eight-year-old girl that wrote a letter to President Obama in the midst of the Flint water crisis, which is still going on, by the way. Flint, Michigan still does not have clean water for all of its residents. That will be a later episode that we talk about and how environmental racism has contributed to that as well as climate change. Anyways, she wrote a letter asking to meet when she would be there to listen in on the congressional hearings in which the Flint water crisis would be talked about. Obama responded that he personally would come to Flint to ensure that the residents there would have exactly what they needed. Mari Kopany has not only vigorously worked to provide clean water for the people in Flint, I mean vigorously y'all, she literally has provided thousands and thousands and thousands of bottles of water for the people in Flint, but she's also partnered with Pack Your Back, an organization aimed at that 
working with lower income students by providing educational resources for them. And she alone spent two weeks raising $10,000 to provide backpacks for over a thousand students. Mari, who's now 10, still campaigns on the behalf of Flint, who, like I said before, has yet to receive clean water. I mean, it's insane that we're literally one of the most powerful countries in the world, yet there are people that live in this nation that don't have access to clean water. She's only 10, but even she has looked at the abuse of power and environmental racism around her and decided for her, the change has to come. I mean, literally, this is a basic necessity. As we're moving into this new year, I want to be super clear in saying that change, although maybe slow at times, it comes. With the midterms just in our rear views, we're already seeing things shift in what's being talked about amongst those governing us. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, my actual hero, I'm literally obsessed with this girl. She is the youngest member to ever be a part of Congress. She is everything I want to be and more. She just proposed a new Green Deal that would move the U.S. away from fossil fuels by 2030, guarantee jobs and raise the minimum wage, and many more needed initiatives for our environmental and economic stability to increase for those at the bottom. She's being championed and actively supported by the Sunrise Movement, a group of ordinary young people with the passion and determination to make climate change an urgent priority in our legislation, all while creating good jobs for millions of people in the future. Mm. I'm so with this entire movement. Anna Navarro, one of my favorite CNN political commentators, is still doing what she's continuously done in the media by persistently remaining true not only to her political values, but also faithfully standing up for her political party by opposing essentially every move made by the Trump administration. Not simply just because she dislikes him, but because of actual facts. Mia Love, a GOP representative from Utah, would also like to see a change amongst her party, being that as an African-American woman, she would like to see her political party holistically embrace communities of color because not only should these people's votes matter to the representatives seeking office, but so should their actual well-being too. They're humans too. And Love acknowledges that the Republican Party's failure to engage with non-white voters will continuously hurt them once election season comes back around. Demographics are changing, you all, which means we as people have to be willing to change with them because new things bring new ideas. These young people are fighting for change that is destined to happen because they are the ones that will be voting for these representatives that have the power to effectively yield change in our government and they're the ones that eventually will be in that position of power to make those critical decisions that affect those around them. While this promise of the new year may seem like a recurring event that we all may be used to, I would encourage you all not to get discouraged with the slow process in which change happens. The right to vote wasn't something that was handed to black and brown people overnight. The right to sit wherever you chose to on a bus wasn't given immediately after Claudette Colvin first sat in the white section on on the bus. In fact, it wasn't even done after Rosa Parks did it nine months later. Going to whichever school you wanted to didn't happen right away. The list is literally endless in the many causes that force people to go through humiliation, risk their lives, and at many points have their lives taken 
all for standing up for what they believed was morally right. Change comes through our, our lives in different ways and aspects. And we can be encouraged to know that with this new year, something very new and worthwhile is likely to come. I hope that this episode was informative and thought-provoking for all that listen and for those of you that will listen in the future. I hope that you all begin looking at this new year with a renewed hope and belief that change for this country is inevitable because we will no longer sit by and allow inequity to continue. This doesn't happen though if we do not get out and vote, become well-informed citizens on our representatives, volunteer, and pursue goodness with all of our beings. If you know me, you know that every year I say, new year, new me. (laughs) And I hope that for each of you, a new year means that you're open to embracing new ideas, thoughts, and people all around you. Remember, all of these opinions are my own, but they should be everyone else's. Have a woke Wednesday. Thank you for another Woke Wednesday. Transcripts of entire episodes will be available on the Woke Wednesday website. Episodes are written and produced by Hannah Mason and Trey Leonard of Lenico Entertainment. Episodes are hosted by Hannah Mason and edited by Trey Leonard. All graphics are designed by Anna French.